Hey, Edith. Hey, Christy. A man walks into a DIY clothing store. Yeah? The tailor said, suit yourself. Oh, good one. <laughs> good one. Good one. Ha ha. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy. And I'm Edith. We're backyard gardeners from Colorado. And neighbors. And friends. These days, gardening has gotten very popular. And we've noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips. A fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hey, Christy. Hello, Edith. How are you? I'm good. And hello to all the gardeners out there and wannabe gardeners and uh, people who just like to eat the produce of gardeners. That's everybody, isn't it? I'm trying to be inclusive. You're being so very <laughs> inclusive. I'm so proud of you. Well, this week we're talking about do-it-yourself, which are things that you can make that you don't have to spend money on. You can uh -huh. kind of gather around your own house to help your gardening. So you can kind of call them inflation fighters as well. Oh, that's such a good point. You really, there's a lot of money. Um, gardening can be expensive, but it does not have to be at That is all. so true. Sometimes people make gardening a very expensive hobby. Yeah. But yet people have been gardening for tens of thousands of years. Yeah, and not as a hobby, but to, you know, to literally grow food. <laughs> right? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> okay. Yes. But first, Edith, you yes. have a big announcement to make, don't I you? I do have a big announcement. I'm pregnant. <laughs> I'm actually not pregnant. If you know me, I am way too old to be pregnant, but I really wanted to hear Christy laugh like that. <laughs> and that just came out of my mouth. My uh, my announcement is, this is my penultimate show, which means that it's my next to the last show, because as Christy and I have discussed, I have just gotten so busy. This was so wonderful to do over the pandemic in the days of where we had nothing and we'd see each other once a week and now, you know, I've been working. I've had jobs since December. And you're in with, your third play in yeah, a row. Without a break. And this one, folks, I'm singing and dancing, and I can do neither. <laughs> so. You said you're sore. Your whole body's sore, My right? whole body's sore. I mean, I can barely walk. So anyway, um, it has been wonderful, and I, I just want to thank all the listeners, and I want to urge you not to go away because Christy has, you know, Christy, she's got all kinds of plans for the future. Don't you, Christy? Well, yeah, we, the plan is that we're going to keep the podcast going. Um, we're going to have some real fun guest co-hosts. And these are people that, um, are live in the Denver metro area who uh -huh. like to garden, who have been, who love the podcast, who've actually been on the podcast before as and actors. Right. That's right. And, um, and our, and, and not, we're not saying they're the best gardeners. They're kind of like us, Edith, right? Yeah. We're not, yes, None exactly. Of us are experts, yeah. but they're just people who have a passion for it and, uh, and who are funny. And so we'll be rolling these, uh, new co-hosts in, in August. But before that, we have Edith's last episode will be on July 19th. Uh-huh. And then on August 2nd, we'll have a very special, the best of Edith, to celebrate everything that Edith has shared with Upside Down Tulips. Which is really kind of embarrassing for me. <laughs> because it's like, it's like the birthday party I was never thrown. For oh, me. For you, you know? For yeah. me. Yeah. It'll, it'll, you yeah. know, Edith, I just, I adore you so much. And. And I know this is not going to be the end of us talking about our gardens because you no. still live down the street from me. Right, And right. we're just going to yeah. be talking about our gardens the way we're used to, which is in each other's backyard over a cup of coffee. Yeah, inspecting each other's gardens, sharing produce, all that wonderful stuff. There just won't be a microphone in front of us. Yeah. And we could swear as much as we want. Oh, good. <laughs> F, Yeah. <laughs> That's effing great. We won't have, we won't have the, our excellent yet enigmatic engineer. Make him come. Yeah. Should Make I, him come I, anyway. I, I will. Yeah. I yeah. will. Yeah, absolutely. Why, did, why does he get to not do, you know, be, he's part of the team. He needs to be there <laughs> always. Well, Edith. Yes. My friend, what is up with your garden this week? Christy, this is, uh, it's been hot. It's been mm -hmm. incredibly dry. This is weed weather. This is when weeds mm -hmm. flourish. And if you're not watching every single day, you've got plants that are just exhausted and dying. 
And and in so in my garden, I've noticed things like the spinach. I put it in the wrong place, Ooh. and it's sun scalded. Ah, oh. the whole big white bleachy parts yes. on my viraflay spinach. Oh, not the viraflay. The viraflay, yeah. Oh, that's it, folks. This is the ginormous spinach that you could use to make a wrap out of, right? Yeah, and the thing is, it has not gone to seed. Because it's bred that way mm. to to resist bolting, uh-huh. but it's sun scalded because it has been so hot. Have you considered some kind of shade over it? We talked about that when we had, a, a, I think it was your, your sister who wrote in wanting to know some shade. You're right? absolutely right. But you know, I really have been kind of too busy. Mm-hmm. It's like I looked at it today before coming over and I'm like, oh my gosh, the sun scalding is even worse than it was. Mm. So, um, So there's that. I planted a row of carrots. I planted a, I would say it was a six foot row of carrots. Do you know what I have in actuality? Uh oh. Two inches. Oh no. I have two inches of carrots that came up. Oh. What the heck is going on? Oh dear. Could you have buried them too deep? I guess I could have. I mean, I, I thought I had a real even little. Little gully, little if tiny gully. If that makes gully. you feel better, that's happened with my basil. I'm having a hard time with basil too. And I was following Judy Seaborn's great advice, which uh-huh. is to moisten the soil beforehand. Right. Shout out to moist. And I, I that and um, only a little bit came up, but I thought it was because it was too cold this spring. So I did another row. Yeah. And nothing has come up. Christy, I planted basil three times, and I have. Three minuscule little basils out there. It's all I have. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You know what? I might try some in a container. That's a good idea. I did that last year because it seems to go really well yeah. in a container. But I'm. I'm. I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna. I because now I'm mad. You know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So then, um, the good. Well, I have one piece of good news. You know, I I ordered five bare root uh, raspberries. They came. They look like sticks. Four of them now have leaves on them. Good. And um, I got them from Johnny's Seeds and I called and I said, you know, I have that one that doesn't, this doesn't not doing anything. Not only will they refund me the money if it's dead. He told me how he said, go and scratch the bark. If there's any green, just a little tiny scratch, any green underneath, just wait. If there's no green underneath, we will reimburse you. They're a great company. That is a great company. And... How are your peppers growing? You know, they seem a little pokey, but I've seen flowers on them. I lost some peppers. I lost some peppers, too. And I had to replace them. I bought some more. And, and, you know, maybe they're about to my shin. Well, I... I, But, folks, you know, my shin isn't very tall. But to me, (laughs) Your shin would be taller. (laughs) Christy, I'm I'm jealous of that. My I have put out there the ones I grew from seed. They are still... An inch, an inch and a half is all they wow. are. And my neighbor, Stephanie, same thing. She goes, I don't know what's up with the peppers this year. You know, I was at Southwest Gardens, who was, folks, is, is our wonderful local nursery and a sponsor of the podcast. And I was visiting Carrie, and he was planting out near the nursery in his garden, which uh-huh. he put on a parking lot. Yeah, huge garden. His peppers were at least two feet tall, and he was planting them out. <sighs> Wow. And you'd like this story, Edith, because it was just, you know, we haven't had much rain at all. And when it does, it's like this real, like the sprinkle that just kind of teases you. Yeah. You think it's going to rain. And it, but, and you know what Carrie called it? What? Squirrel spit. <laughs> <laughs> Christy, that leads me. That's a perfect intro to, um, you know, how we love words and how we love categories of animals, like an army of frogs and, and whatnot. Do you know what rabbits are called? No. A fluffle. Oh, that's so cute. Isn't that wonderful? A I, fluffle. I, I have a fluffle of rabbits. You do? You know, well, you know, I have um, the rabbit that I call Cindy, also known as uh, Cinnabon. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. what happened. Well, then my handsome and handy husband saw another little baby bunny. Oh, no. I'm saying, oh, no, because, you know, they eat things. Sure. I mean, like, you, like I say, I don't mind a little chewing. Yeah. And I don't think that they ate my peppers you know i read that rabbits like grass that's what more I, than they like that's what i always see them doing is eating the grass yeah. in the yard and we were our minds were perverted by by peter rabbit yes by what was her name beatrix potter yes and the farmer yelling at the rabbits always eating the vegetables mm-hmm. apparently maybe they do that in england but they don't do that in colorado yeah apparently yeah so i have a fluffle of rabbits in my 
backyard. And now you know what to call them. I love that. Yeah. So what else is going on out there? Well, um, well, first of all, I want to talk to you about my red bird in a tree. Oh, I remember you talking about this the first year that we did this. It's a lovely little perennial I have that it's flowers. Seriously, everybody, they look like little red birds. They're tiny, beautiful, and it can get to maybe be about three feet tall. Wow. Really nice, but it's been struggling the last couple of years. So I've been collecting seed off of it. Yeah. And hoping that I could winter sow it. So I sprinkled some seed in a milk jug and carefully washed it, washed it, washed it, washed it. Nothing was coming up. Nothing was coming up. But then there was a little green and I went, ooh, one little plant. I thought, that's okay. I'll take one little tiny red bird in a tree. So I nurtured it. I watered it. I kept it out in the sun. And Edith, I want to show you what I've been growing. A petunia? A petunia. <laughs> So that's disappointing, but it's a pretty petunia. It's a very pretty petunia. I like purple petunia. And then, but then I had this little plant that I've had in my backyard, and uh, just kind of seeing it, it would be kind of suffering. But then I noticed, I went, hey, you know, it, it grows next to the Veronica, and they have very similar types of leaves. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but they're like the same color leaf. They kind of spiral around a stem the same way, yeah. and they the leaves come to a point, and maybe the sides are a little jagged. So they look very similar until they start to bloom. And I realized, ooh, this plant must be my red bird in a tree because it's different than all the Veronica that's around it. Yeah. And it's coming back really super strong. Way to go. Way to go. Uh-oh. Is that good or bad? Eat it. It was not what was a red it? bird in a tree. What was it? It was freaking creeping bellflower. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it just bloomed and I just went, oh, my God. Oh, I have been nurturing no. creeping bellflower. Oh, the bane Which, of my existence, creeping bellflower. Remember, Marcia sent us that letter about nurture, nur- nourishing yes. a weed. Because sometimes you just can't I have done tell. it before. And just I've when I it. think I know the difference between a weed and a flower, uh-huh. I have, again, nurtured a weed. Which <sighs> brings me to this other point, which is that a, um, a friend of mine emailed me and asked me if I wanted any... Um, uh, uh, she called it uh, Campanella. She says, there are a bunch of roots and soil of Campanella. Would you like that? I went, Campanella? I couldn't, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite remember what that was. Yeah. So I type it into Google and it comes up. She asked me if I wanted a big bag of soil filled with creeping bellflower roots. Oh my gosh. And I had to say so nice and politely. Oh no. Um. Thank hell you. no. <laughs> <laughs> hell no, hell no. Um, uh, and then the other thing I wanted to tell you, oh, uh, here's some. Here's a good story. So you know how from the very beginning of the podcast, Edith, we always kind of marvel about things that grow in our compost pile. Yeah. And for a long time for us, it was spaghetti squash for both of us, right? Uh-huh. Because we, we grow the spaghetti squash, we eat the spaghetti Mine squash. Mine were mutants. Mine were inedible. Oh, that's right. They were just inedible. Work. Yeah. It was because they cross-pollinated? Probably, I guess. Well, it, and also because the seeds, our compost piles don't get hot enough, so the seeds don't fully decompose, and so we get all these, yeah. you know, squashes growing. Last year, I... Um, thought I had more spaghetti squash. I was politely surprised that it was pumpkins. Yeah, so Remember yeah. I saved the pumpkin seeds? Uh-huh. I winter sowed them to see if they would take, and I got uh, nine pumpkin seeds. They all sprouted. Wow. And I didn't know what to do with them, Edith. Yeah. So you know what I did? No. I planted them in my compost pile. <laughs> <laughs> Purposefully. Wow. I figured the compost pile is telling me something. Okay. That, that's where they like to grow. And this is an area that's mostly, com- you know, has mostly compost, did, did but it's not quite. Did you plant all nine of them? I gave away two. You have seven pumpkins out there growing? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. They look beautiful. Wow. They look I amazing. I bet they do. But they're going to get gigantic, right? I mean. I hope I get tons of pumpkins. That would be awesome. I hope you do, too. Yay. Speaking of not having tons of something, I saved my worst news for last. I will have peaches, but I'll have like five. Oh, no. That frost killed most of them. Remember that late frost we had? When that it snowed in May? Snowed and it was so, so, so cold. Yeah, it was cold. 60 degree difference, I think, yeah, from one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
Ah, son of a gun. Gosh darn it. Is that going to ruin Palisade Peaches and I'm going to be so livid? Palisade Peaches, it's warmer down there. Oh, okay, good. They don't get the, yeah, they're on the other side of the divide, I think. So it's That's warmer sad. down there. I know people yeah. think it's weird that Colorado has the best peaches. If you don't live in Colorado, you don't know. You don't know, but yeah. Friends, if yeah. you can ever get a Colorado peach, you should run and get and it. get them. I would put it up next to a Georgia peach oh, anytime. I'm going to say this. Yeah. Better than a Georgia peach. Let's say better than a Georgia peach. I think peach. Colorado peaches are juicier. I think Colorado's hockey is juicier than Tampa's. Go abs. <laughs> <laughs> well, friends, if you don't understand what the heck we're talking about, uh oh, if there are words or terms you don't understand, just go to our website and look up the ever funny and always informative Upside Down Dictionary at UpsideDownTulips.com. Or click on the link in our show notes and look at our fun stuff on Facebook, Insta- Instagram, Pinterest. This week we have a brand new pod play written by the beautiful and talented Edith Weiss. And pregnant. <laughs> You made our engineer laugh. <laughs> That's so rare. Yeah. I know. Um, and uh, what are you calling this one, Edith? It's a new Rapunzel. It's Rapunzel, um, Rapunzel saved by a garden. Ooh, nice. Rapunzel is saved by a garden. There you go. Rapunzel Retold, a fable for gardeners. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Rapunzel. She was named after the vegetable Rapunzel, also known as Campanula Rapunculus, a hardy vegetable plant that is entirely edible, leaves, roots, and all. Poor Rapunzel, the girl, not the vegetable, had been taken by a witch when just a little girl and locked into a tower. This is so boring. There is nothing to do but watch my hair grow. Her hair grew and grew, and from her window she could see the witch's wonderful vegetable garden and orchard. She watched the garden grow right along with her hair, but the witch, the horrendous miasma, never let her have anything from the garden. (laughs) One day, a village boy saw little Rapunzel gazing at the garden and threw her a radish, which she ate and was astonished. This is so good! She called to the boy. Thank you. What are you anyway? I'm a boy. The boy then came by every day, picked some produce and threw it through her window. Turnips, apples, carrots, Brussels sprouts came flying through the tower's window for as long as the gardening season lasted. Once when the horrendous miasma flew away to go to a witch's convention, Rapunzel collected some of the veggies she had been hiding and made a soup. She grew big, strong, and smart. So when the boy called out to her to let her hair down so he could climb it, she said, No, that would really hurt. But wait a minute. I have a better idea. So she wrapped her long, long braid around the bedpost and using it as a rope, let herself out the window and down the tower wall without hurting a single hair on her head. When she got to the ground, the boy was waiting. So that's what a boy looks like up close, she said. He promptly asked her to marry him. Uh, it's a little soon, don't you think? I mean, we just met. He agreed. They decided to get to know one another, maybe see other people for a while, and then together grow the best garden around, which they did. And then they lived as happy gardeners for a very long time. So we're talking about DIY in the garden. That means do do it yourself. Nice. (laughs) These are things that you can make, create yourself without Mm -hmm. and save yourself some money. Yeah. And that wonderful feeling of accomplishment. I mean, it's just really cool to to take things and reuse them and not throw stuff away and become self-sufficient in that way. Love it. And a big one, the first one we're going to talk about is do-it-yourself potting soil. And you can save 50 to 75%. And have you noticed, Christy, the prices for potting soil have gone up? I think they've doubled. They literally doubled this year. And friends who don't know the difference, we're talking about potting soil, not garden soil. Because garden soil is an amendment that is mixed with native soil and other things like um, composted bark 
or mushroom compost or cow and chicken manure that's blended to put in your garden. But potting soil is actually a soilless uh, material that's mostly airy and light, and it's really great for container gardening, house plants, and seed starting. Well, Christy, the, the potting mix recipe that I have is made of three different parts, and I made this last year, and it, it was killer. One part peat moss, one part top or garden soil, mm. which which I didn't use my own garden soil. I used stuff that I bought in a bag because it's lighter. Right, yes. And one part steer manure. Mm. Mix them all together, and then if you like, you can kind of knead them together like it's bread, put it on a tarp, knead it together. If you like, you can add a fertilizer. You can add a 555, which uh-huh. is equal parts nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Or what I did was I added some of my own compost to it. That's also a really good idea. Yeah, and it it was really a good potting soil, folks. Really, really good. Some other things that people will add into a potting, to make your own potting soil. They'll also add that, I don't know how to pronounce it, Edith, that C-O-I-R fiber. Core, uh, coconut fiber? Coconut fiber, I, right. I, I just I just make, make up my own pronunciation. I think it's called core or career. Yeah, it was either Co-year. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> but you could add, you can add that in to make your own potting soil. Also, people will use perlite. Mm-hmm. which is a mined volcanic rock. And when they when you heat it, it expands. And it looks like small white balls of styrofoam. It does indeed. And it will just lighten your soil. Vermiculite can do the same thing, which is a mined mineral that is conditioned by heating to expand into light particles. And people use it to increase the porosity. So it will increase the mix's water holding capacity. Mm-hmm. In addition to adding calcium and magnesium, which is good for your plants. So you can put a little of that in it too. Um, They're also major components of seed starting soil, Mm. which is different from potting soil. It's much, much, much lighter. And I think seed soil, oh gosh, seed starting soil for that is is basically soil less, I believe. Yes. The seed starting. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, We've talked before, we talked about this in episode... 26, we have a soil test, and it's actually on our website Uh that you can do to see what is the heck going on with your soil. So you can tell if your soil is filled with stuff, you know, that's Mm -hmm. that if it's loamy or not. Yeah, this is for either when you're starting the first time to garden, Mm -hmm. what's my soil like? Is that will dictate what you can grow? Or if things are not looking right in the garden, it and you're watering okay, chances are it's something, it's the soil, chances are. Right? It all starts with it, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, a, 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 the ideal soil texture is equal parts of sand, silt, and clay, and that's why people call it loamy or loam. And um, once you know what kind of soil you have, you can decide how you want to amend it. Um, and here's the easiest thing in the world, folks, you can do, is get some soil from your garden, not a lot, Use a mesh sieve or an old colander and sift the soil to remove any debris, like rocks and stuff. Fill the jar half with your soil and fill the remainder with clean water and add one tablespoon of powdered dishwashing detergent. Cap the jar, shake it vigorously until the soil turns into a uniform slurry and set on a level surface and wait for a minute. Whatever's at the bottom, that line, Put a little mark there. That shows the sand. After two hours, for the next set of layer, mark with the permanent marker. That's your silt. And after 48 hours, mark the top set of layer with the permanent marker. And this is the clay. And you can use a ruler to measure all those three layers to see if you have loam or not. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. We did it. We did do it. I did it in my vegetable garden, and I had all three were equal. Mine were too. Yeah. Yay. We've been amending the soil forever. So. 20 years, right? That, that'll do it. Yeah. yeah. And then you can also determine if you have acid or alkaline soil. Which is also important. It dictates what you can grow. And you know, grow. you could go to the store and buy an expensive test for that. Mm-hmm. But, or you could just do it yourself. And the, uh, the other place you can get a test if you don't want to do it yourself, you can go to your local extension of your university. Oh, that's a good point, Edith. And they really, usually uh, they charge less. Oh, that's a good point. Because they're a public university. Mm-hmm. 
Well, if you want to do your own test with items from your kitchen, here's how you can tell if you have acidic or alkaline soil. Place two tablespoons of soil in a bowl and add one half cup vinegar. If the mixture fizzes, you have alkaline soil. To see if you have acidic soil, place two tablespoons of soil in a bowl and moisten it with distilled water. Add one half cup baking soda. If that mixture fizzes, you have acidic soil. If it does not react to either test, the soil has a neutral pH. And um, that is the greatest thing that you want because it'll help your plant roots absorb and access nutrients in the best way. Is there anything vinegar cannot do? Hey, I just put it in my hair yesterday. What? Yeah, I use it like an apple cider vinegar rinse. You're kidding. Now, I did not even know that. And you, so you, you dilute it and... I put a quarter cup of water. Uh-huh. No, wait. A quarter, quarter cup, cup of, of apple cider vinegar uh-huh. into a cup of water. Uh-huh. And then I rinsed my hair with it. Nice. And then you rinse that out. Otherwise, your hair is going to smell like... Yeah. A salad. Yeah. <laughs> be, be bobbing for apples <laughs> on your head. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, Christy, that's great. That That's really good advice on the um, soil mix jerk testing business. <laughs> <laughs> what do we talk about now? What do um, we do? Do you want to talk about uh, bug repellents? Yeah. Because yeah. you could go buy a bug repellent or you could make your own. I have a recipe right here. Yeah. One red onion, mm. four garlic cloves, two, tables, two tablespoons cayenne. So... Chop up the onion, chop up the cloves, put all that in water, put it in the fridge for 12 hours mm. because bugs don't like cayenne. Mm-hmm. And um, I guess they don't like onions and cloves either. Sounds like it would keep vampires away also. Very good point. <laughs> We're ready for the apocalypse, Christy. <laughs> Here's another recipe for bug spray, which is uh, mix one and one half teaspoons of mild liquid soap. We recommend using a clean soap like mm. a Castile soap. Yeah. With one quart of water and spray the mixture directly on infected surfaces of the plants because bugs don't like soap. And another way to do that too is you could also add vegetable oil. Can That'll you, help it stick to the, the plants a bit more. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. The Can oil you, coats the bodies of the bugs. And effectively just suffocates them as it blocks the pores through which they breathe. So just ignore the screaming in the night. That's all. <laughs> Christy, uh, um, I think we should may put put a, like a warning sign here. If your plants are little teeny tiny like my peppers, I wouldn't spray them. I wouldn't yeah. spray seedlings, especially not with this onion, garlic, and cayenne thing. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Which is weird though, because that's kind of when they, when my kind of need it the most. Yeah. My plants, like my zinnias, when they're yeah. small, the bugs just attack them like nobody's business. But once they get to a certain height, that's then so they're okay. true. That's so true. But I, but I think maybe your recipe, the soap one, would be easier yeah. on little tiny plants yeah. than my recipe. That's all. That's a good point. Thank you. Um, you you make your own seed starting pots, don't you, Edith? Oh my gosh, I use a million different things for that. So you don't go out and buy those little peat pots or buy little plastic things. You those just make your well, own. I, I use everything. I mean, I have been reusing the same little plastic things for years. I also use uh, egg cartons. You can use egg shells. I've seen that. You can use the shell of an avocado. Or you can use um, a, the shell of citrus fruit. Oh, like oranges yeah. or grapefruit. So do you think that the roots can penetrate that or do you think that they will have dissolved or not dissolved, decomposed in time? Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Yes, they you can. So you can bury the whole, if you put it in you an bury orange, the whole thing. And I think you have to poke holes in the bottom of it. There of you it. go. There There's you drainage. Go. Yeah. But I, but I think that the roots can go through it when you plant, you just plant yes. the whole thing. So you don't have to worry about transplant shock. But, but I would, that that's a good point. I would also like in an egg, I would also crack it on the bottom because mm. when they're little, the roots are not that strong. So give them mm. a little, you know, movement of the eggshell. Yeah. I know people who use muffin pans. So you take, literally, Edith, those cupcake, paper cupcake oh, holders. Oh, yeah. Poke some holes in the bottom. Put the c- cupcake 
holders in the muffin pan. Oh. Put in your soil mix. Sow your seeds. And, you know, put it in a sunny window or oh, on a mat that. with some lights. Oh, I love that. That's great. And, of course, people use those newspaper make newspaper pots have you seen that i have yeah you do have to buy the the wooden mold do you i mm-hmm. think so or maybe there's a way not to do it if, folks if you make seed starting pots with newspaper it would not be that hard if you think about it. it wouldn't be that hard especially i don't do origami or anything and i don't even fold things well you should see my you don't drawers. even fold your laundry <laughs> that's, the, that's exactly right <laughs> looks terrible but anyway yeah, there's got to be an easy way to do that, and you could probably Google it or and ask. because the newspaper will decompose. decompose. Yeah. Okay, we'll be back with more "Do It Yourself" in the garden. But first, here's one of our favorite repeats of a fun pod play called "Door Trash" by Christy Montour Larson. Um, Edith, you wrote what? this. I did. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Get a Lara Lura. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Claire, a busy working woman who doesn't always have time to prepare a meal. So I tried some meal delivery services. The first was Door Bash. I ordered a meal of pesto on zoodles and had a glass of wine while waiting for my dinner. Door bash for 212 Main Street. And there it is, right on time. Coming. What the? Hey, hey, stop that. Hey. Oh, my God. They broke the door down. Now I have to get a new door and more wine. After that, I tried a service called Door Clash. The fact that their logo was a stove made of swords should have tipped me off. Door Clash for 212 Main Street. Thunder! Whoa! And Wait. lunge! Stop and that! Ah. Pivot and uh. lunge! Lunge! <gasps> Retreat! Retreat! My dinner is slashed to ribbons! I can't eat this! So thinking that the third time was the charm, I called door hash. When the doorbell rang, I was both hopeful and hungry. Then I heard this through the door. Ding dong! Hello! Oh. Maybe I have the wrong address. I am so hungry. Oh my God, I have a bag of food right here in my hand. It's mine, just leave it on the porch, I'm coming. This is delicious. Right in my hand, out of nowhere. Awesome. That's when I decided to grow some of my own food myself. Upside down tulips was right there to help me out grow something and deliver it yourself from your own backyard. I love all the fencing in door trash. I thought that was fun. I love, you know what? It's fun because we have an engineer who can make great sound effects. Yeah. I love (laughs) sound effects. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Another expensive thing you can buy in the store is fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And yet you can DIY it, can't you, Edith? So easy. Easy peasy to DIY. There are so many different ways to do it too. Uh, if you live in an area that allows maybe grandfathers in horses or they're on the outskirts, make yourself some poop tea. Poop tea is really, really good for your plants. Put some turds in a bucket, add water, steep. And in a while, I don't know, a couple days, a couple of weeks, you've got some amazing poop tea. That's what Matt Damon did in The Martian. That's exactly <laughs> what he did in The Martian. <laughs> <laughs> but he used his own he used astronauts astronaut you, poop you're instead right. of but horse you're not poop. suggesting using human you're saying use oh yeah don't use human i don't know why <laughs> but because that guy on the the survivalist he pooped out the tomato seeds remember he was naked and afraid naked and afraid and pooping out tomato seeds but for some reason i keep reading human waste should not be used in the garden but i don't mm-hmm. know if that's true i i, I don't know Christy. matt damon didn't didn't bother him. You adore Matt Damon, don't you? You <laughs> literally talk about him all the time. Don't tell my handsome and handy husband. Oh, I would never. Okay, the other fertilizer that I make and everybody, well, the, my Bokashi experiment, mm-hmm. which is, mm-hmm. folks, get a bucket. It's always involving a bucket. Put holes in the bottom. Put it in another bucket because it's going to, it's going to, water's going to come out. It's going to seep. It's going to seep. And then throw stuff. No, throw. 
put stuff like kitchen scraps. You can put chicken breasts. You can put bones in it. And then let it sit there for a really long time. Along the way, the water that you collect, dilute it with other water because it's really concentrated nutrient water from the stuff in the bucket. You can use that all along. Don't use it on little teeny tiny plants. Use it on established plants. And then when you see that the bokashi has mostly turned to what looks like soil, dig dig it into your garden. Mm. It, um, it's pretty darn good. Caveat. Uh-oh. My caveat is <laughs> one time when I opened the top of the bucket, because it's anaerobic, folks. It doesn't want any air. And I had, I covered it with plastic. Then I covered it with a bucket top. Then I put a big, heavy rock on it to make it anaerobic. However, one of the times when I put in some kitchen scraps, a fly must have gotten in there and laid an egg which led to, I don't know, billions of maggots. <laughs> One of the grossest things I've ever... Do you know and what maggots smell like? No. Terrible. Like, Terrible smell. Like like, Ew. like, rot, like rotting? Or? Yes, like rotting and yuckiness and mucusy and blah. Um, you know, when I was in Iceland, I had fermented shark. Did you like it? It smelled like... I it think smelled Bokashi. like <laughs> it smelled like maggots. I think it smelled like yeah, rotten. It Bokashi probably did bucket. have maggots on it. How I bet you it did have maggots. Do they bury it underground? I don't know how they make it, but it must be an anaerobic anaerobic thing. I have understood. Have. I had a friend who went to Iceland. They bury it in the ground, Christy, that would make for sense. a long yeah, time. It, it has a smell. Let me tell you, Oof. maggots. Okay, but the nice thing about after you have fermented shark, you can have a. Shot of schnapps. You have to but have. When you, you have a, to have a shot. A when, shot. You, when you open a a bad bucket of bokashi. Yeah. Where's your schnapps? It's it's, it's not there. Yeah, it's not there for you. It's not there. You got to go to the store. Okay. Um, speak- One more thing. One oh, more yeah. thing. Oh, though. cool. Yeah, do leaf it. Leaf yeah. mold. Leaf oh, mold. I was going to bring that up. Good, good, good. Because it's the cleanest. I mean, if it's just, I love leaf mold. You rake the leaves in the fall, or you rake your neighbor's leaves if you don't have a tree. You put them in a bag. You try and get all the air out, smush it down, water it. Put the bag shut, make it tight, and then leave it for next season, and you will get literally like black gold, they call it, that crumbly, Mm. beautiful black soil. It's like the stuff that's in your gutters, isn't it? Yes. Christy, I literally scoop out my gutters and put them in a bucket stuff up there. My husband does that for me. Isn't that sweet? He's up on the ladder. He's, yeah. That's really sweet. Yeah. It'd be easier for him to just throw it away, but he stays it for me. Yeah, that's really good. Hey, Edith, this is how I feel about my husband. You know how some movies show people kissing in the rain? Yeah. Well, I'm just happy enough I have a guy who'll run out there and get the cushions off the porch chairs when the weather starts kicking up. Oh, sweet. <laughs> and is out there cleaning out gutters for yeah, you by hand. that's right. And- well, um, we also have talked before, and this is also on our website, about how to make a DIY very easy compost pile Mm. you don't have to go out and buy an expensive compost maker or like my husband made beautiful compost piles but there here's a here's a cheap and easy way to do it you can um, go to the hardware or your farm supply store and get some welded wire mesh Um, it's like a chicken wire but it's a little bit more substantial Mm -hmm. where the openings are like one by two inches and it comes in about three foot widths and if you go to, you know, a, a box store, you might be able to get something like between 50 to 60 bucks for a 50 foot roll, which is more than enough because really all you need is 11 feet. Um, or you could use cattle fencing, which has larger holes mm-hmm. or hardware cloth, which has smaller holes. And um, it likes to curl, which is what we want it to do. So you just c- put it in a wrap, put it in a mm-hmm. circle, let mm-hmm. it curl into a mm-hmm. circle, mm-hmm. add some twist ties to it. And then throw your grass clippings, your leaves, your tea bags, your coffee grounds, your non-meat kitchen scraps, shredded newspaper, mm-hmm. all that. Um, every now and then put in a shovel full of soil and then water the contents. And uh, one is fine, but two is better because then when one is done, yeah, you can yeah. move it to the next one and start a brand new one. Yeah. You know, years ago when I had like no money to spare whatsoever and a really small backyard, I just dug a hole. Literally, I dug a hole and I started putting stuff in the hole. And um, 
we had a, a bunch of feral cats in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So any mice that were attracted to this, the cats kind of took care of. Mm-hmm. But really, if you want to start at the ground zero, I don't have a penny to spare, dig a hole. Put that stuff in it. <laughs> right? You know, a, a good hole dug can solve a lot of problems. <laughs> yes. If you've murdered someone, dig <laughs> that, that hole. hole. That's right. A good dug hole. Um, and uh, if you ever get mildew on your plants, which I do, and I think people on the East Coast must get that a lot yes. too, you, should, you could go buy a spray, but here's how you make your own. You just need baking soda, friends. Um, it is a uh, very preventative, it's a nice preventative measure against mildew. And, and remind us what plants are, part, are get mildew a lot. In my garden, yeah. it's cucumbers. Mm-hmm. Squash. The gourd family, the yeah. curcurbits. And it's good to get rid of the mildew once because it, once the plant, once the leaves get too much mildew on it, they'll shrivel up and die and then they won't have shade for the right. fruits. Right. And less photosynthesis going on. Good point. Mm. Um, so you take one tablespoon of baking soda, one half teaspoon of a non detergent soap, like a Castile, a clean Castile soap, mm-hmm. and one gallon of water. And you spray the mixture liberally on your plants. I usually start doing that around this time of year because I want to get it, I want to curb any problems. That's a really good idea, Christy, because pretty soon we're going to have the Japanese beetles. We'll be battling them. I was going to ask you that. Have you seen it? No, yet? no. Have you? I have not either, but I did see a posting on Facebook where somebody had it, but I think they might have been in southern Denver. I think, I think that's that, where they get them more than I we think do. we're going to get them in a week or two. I mean, it's it's it always is in July, uh-huh. in the very, very heat of July. So maybe, maybe we're getting them in a week or two. Okay. Well, of course, the greatest mm-hmm. DIY for Japanese beetles, since we're on that topic, yeah, is a bucket of soapy water and push them in and watch yeah. them drown. Yeah. It doesn't have to be clean detergentless soap. It can be da- Dawn, di- Dawn yeah. or any, any dishwasher. And, and we, you just have to do it or they, they'll just destroy everything. Yeah. Or the really great DIY thing, if you really want to buy something, as we've always said, is yeah. buy, a, <laughs> buy a trap and give it to your neighbor down the street. Because those <laughs> traps that they sell <laughs> attract them to your yard. Which is good if it's a new area. But if your area has yeah. already been infested with Japanese beetles, yeah. don't because they the can fly, worse. folks. They can fly. So, so just just you know. Finally, I want to say one more thing um, about do it yourself, and that is uh-huh. to collect your own seeds. Mm. If you've never collected your own seeds, it's so very easy to do. You can easily learn how. Any place there's a flower, there will be seeds. If they're greenish, they are not ready. They are going to look brown and they're going to look brittle. Just like if you ever buy coriander seeds at the grocery store, that's exactly what pretty much, that's the, mm, that's what all the seeds kind of look like. I mean, they may be smaller, bigger, darker, but, um, but just be one, one word of caution about collecting your own seeds. If you let things go to seed and then you get busy and then the wind comes, you're going to have no control over anything for years. <laughs> Are you talking about your 100 heads of lettuce? Yeah. You know, I had them again this year. I had like over 100. Wow. And and when you have that many, there's not heads. They're like shreds of lettuce. Sh- like a carpet of lettuce is what I had in Ooh, my garden. That's just kind of pretty, though. It was pretty. And it's the first thing up, so. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah. So, but just be careful because um, you, you may not be a haphazard gardener yeah. like I am. And, you know, I would say when it comes to collecting seeds is that I don't collect them now. I don't let the plants go brown Mm -hmm. i will i will deadhead them yeah you do which is the process of removing spent flowers Mm -hmm. um and you just kind of follow along to where the stem meets another stem and just nip it off with your fingers or if you have a nippers or something like that. oh my gosh that's what they call nip it in the bud that's where that (laughs) thing came from right (laughs) yes edith i never knew that I once I once uh, directed a play and that phrase was in there and the actor was insistent that that was a typo. He said it's not nip it in the butt, it's called nip it in the butt. 
And I go, no, it's not nipping in the butt. <laughs> why would it's you nip in the something butt? in the butt? I don't know what he was thinking, oh but I had to like, no, I had to like say, here, here's the phrase. Wow. That's really I had to go funny. to the library because it was before the internet. And I had to say, here's the phrase, here's the nip, it in, nip the butt. it in the butt. He wanted to say nip it in the butt. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> wow. Folks, do some DIY out there. Hey, Edith, is your mail coming late all the time lately? Yeah, it is. What? Ring, ring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who's there? <laughs> it's mailbag time. Ah, oh, good. Oh, good. We got through that. Hey, hey, Christy, we have a letter here from Lisa from Lakewood. It's a good one. Dear um, Edith and Christy, did you know that there is a natural antidepressant in the country? It's a mycobacterium vaccae bacteria found in the soil, and humans can ingest or inhale it when they spend time in nature and gardening. This bacteria stimulates the brain part responsible for producing serotonin. The most passionate gardeners will tell you that their garden is their happy place and that the actual physical act of gardening reduces stress and lifts mood. It does for me, Christy. It sure does. Mycobacterium vaccae also improve cognitive function. It has an effect on Crohn's disease and even rheumatoid arthritis. The natural effects of these antidepressant bacteria in the soil can be felt for up to three weeks. Heck, says Lisa, I'm thinking I should smear it all over me and ingest a generous portion daily. I read that it feeds on decaying organic material, and God knows I'm decaying. <laughs> <laughs> LOL, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Do you remember this, Edith? We talked about this bacteria way back in episode 30 when mm -hmm. we talked about trees. Mm -hmm. And that, well, first of all, that soil is alive. Very, very much so. And dirt is dead. Mm -hmm. And soil has, one tablespoon of soil has more organisms in it than there are people on earth. And there are 5,000 different types of bacteria in one gram of soil. Wow. And this uh, mycobacterium, we first learned about it from Christopher Lowry, who is the associate professor in the Department of Integrative Physiology and Center for Neuroscience at the University of Colorado. And he published an article in Neuroscience. And not only does it say all the things that Lisa said, um, when this bacterium, Edith, was introduced to cancer patients, they reported a better quality of life and less stress. Wow. And the bacterium was also tested on rats, and the results were increased cognitive ability, lower stress, and better concentration on tasks than the control group. You know, Christy, I don't know if I want rats with more cognitive ability. <laughs> I really don't. I don't like rats. Who does? Some people like it because of that movie. That Disney movie about the rat that was a chef. Oh, Ratatouille. Grossest thing ever. A rat <laughs> as a chef. Are you serious? Well, um, Lisa, mm -hmm. we appreciate your letter. And I think it also, also reminds it like, remember when you were a kid, you ever make mud pies and how happy you were? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Like, And they was... say if your soil is clean and a kid wants to eat your soil, you know, kids do that. Sure. Let them. Let them. Yeah, why not? Not like not like heaps of it, but you know. Well, we had a pot play about that. Remember Phoebe's choice moist soil? That's right, choice moist soil. Where all she was doing was just selling a bag of yeah. soil. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, that's what we should be doing. We should be selling upside down tulip soil. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, friends, if you find anything exciting about the world of gardening that you want to share with us, or if you have any of your own do it yourself in the garden. That would be a benefit to everybody. Won't you write to us? We wish you would. Upside Down Tulips at Gmail or our website at Upside Down Tulips dot com. Oh, please, Edith. Yeah. Will you share with us an inspiration for the week? I will. This is from H. Fred Dale. I don't know who he was, but he sounds like a farmer, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. H. Fred Dale. He says, my green thumb came only as a result of the mistakes I made while learning to see things from the plant's point of view. It would not hurt anybody to see things from That's anybody right. else's point of view. That's right. Plant's point of view, pet's point of view. Just a little reminder. Thank you, Edith. Oh, you're welcome, Christy. 
And friends, you have reached the end of another episode of Upside Down Tulips. We are Edith Weiss and Christy Montour Larson. Did you enjoy this? Why don't you then hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you listen to your podcasts? Thank you so much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. Go to her website, denisegentilini.com, or find that link at upsidedowntulips.com. And many thanks to the kindness of our talented friend, Josh Hartwell, whose big line was, I'm a boy. (laughs) (laughs) Josh, you nailed it. (laughs) And thank you to our excellent yet enigmatic engineer. And a special thanks to our local nursery and friend of the show, Southwest Gardens. Yay! Join us in two weeks for another episode that will delight and amaze you. It is Edith's last episode. Of course it will delight and amaze us. you got to join in or I will be undelighted and very much not amazed. Well, wait, never mind. Don't forget. Yeah. If you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down.